My name's Rod Gillis and I'm the Vice Chair of the Marketing Society in Scotland. I'm delighted that yet again the Marketing Society is involved in the Young Enterprise Scotland Schools Scheme. We think it's fantastic seeing every year the quality and the creativity of the ideas and the enterprise and business sense that goes into the work you guys put together. Really looking forward to seeing what you do this year. The idea of this session is to maybe have a little chat about marketing, what it is, how it's useful, and a couple of little hints and tips about how you guys can make the absolute most of the marketing opportunities you have when you're working on your business. Okay, first up, what is marketing? I've worked in marketing for nearly 20 years on some quite big brands and uh, it's a difficult question to answer, I'm not sure I can tell you. Um, marketing at its best should be involved in almost every aspect of a business. It should help set strategy, it should help identify the best things that a business can make, the best thing people that it should be trying to sell to, and then obviously the comms and the way that it explains its business to potential consumers, potential buyers or users of the service or product that you create. Um, yeah, at its best, marketing is involved in absolutely everything. But I suppose people's perceptions of marketing usually come down to that it's about telling people about your service or your product and encouraging them to use it by making clear the benefits and the features that and what they'll get out of buying it or using it or hiring it. Um, so in that context, I think communications come down to two things. One, working out really clearly who you want to talk to and then working out really clearly what you want to say to them. Working out who your product or service is for is probably the single most important thing. I think it's really easy to say, oh, well, who wants what we are selling or what we are making or what we are providing and go, everyone. And actually, that just means you're being far too broad in your ambition. There are very few products, even the biggest brands or products or services in the world aren't being used by everyone. So focus your efforts, focus your attention, understand and try and have a really clear idea of who are the people that we want to try and sell our product or service to. And then once you've made that decision, don't talk to anyone else. Don't waste your time, don't waste your resources, your limited supply of time or money if you're spending money on it. Don't waste your efforts talking to people that aren't part of that core target. And then, what do you want them to hear? Just be really clear about one or two really simple, clear messages that get across what your product or service is and why it's useful to these people. And again, once you've decided that, don't tell them anything else. Don't waste your time on, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. If you put lots of features and benefits into a product and then try and tell people about it, you haven't got the time and they don't have the attention. So actually, a real clear focus on one or two features or benefits of your product or features or benefits of your service and a real clear, simple explanation of why it will be useful to people is much more valuable than, oh, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. Just think about it. What are people going to remember when they take away from your stuff? What are people going to take out? What are they going to understand about the product or service that you're offering? Much better to be clear, much better to be simple. One thing, infinitely more effective than five things. Yeah? So really stick to that really clear and simple message about what you want people to hear and take away. And then also have a think about how, how you tell people things affects what they hear. So actually, if I'm being quite a serious product about, I don't know, savings, if I used Comic Sans as a font for my logo, you're telling me something about your business, regardless of the name of that business, regardless of the name of that service. If it's about finance and it's in the Comic Sans font, I'm maybe not thinking you're a serious business and you're telling me something about it regardless of the words you've printed. So think about all of that. Think about colour. 
Colour can tell people things. Red signifies danger and excitement and passion. Green, calmness, natural, wholesome, maybe eco. Blue, especially dark blue, that's a bit more regal and royal. And, you know, do you, you see what I mean? You can have these little cues that have got nothing to do with the actual words or the message that you are giving people, but you're still telling them something. So think about some of those things as well. So that's it. That would be my, that's what marketing is in a communication sense. Um, now, if you go to university and you study marketing, which I really hope some of you want to do, um, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. But fundamentally, when it comes to communications, who do you want to talk to and what do you want to say to them? Those two things. If you focus on those two things, you're already going to be ahead of some of the competitors that you've got in this competition. I'm going to finish up by just having a little chat about having ideas. Um, some of you may already have a really strong business idea, and that's fantastic. Some of you might still be casting around and discussing in your groups about what product or service or business that you want to run, and you're still looking for ideas. Regardless of where you are on the spectrum of that, I think it's useful to have a think about how you have ideas and how you make them better. Because I've, I've worked in innovation, uh, um, you know, developing new products and new services for nearly 20 years. And uh, the one thing that I can tell you about having ideas is the only way to have good ideas is to have lots and lots and lots of bad ones. You have bad ideas and then you kick them around in a group and you tighten them up and you, or you kill them off or you, you see that little nugget of gold or that little gem that's hidden in that bad idea. And between you, you take it out and you polish it and you make it into this gleaming little lovely idea that forms the effective kernel of a brilliant product or service. So don't be afraid to have lots and lots and lots and lots of bad ideas. And make sure that you're in a group that you're, you know, your business partners with you, that you you're you're you feel comfortable saying, I've got a really bad idea, but there's something in there that I'd like to, you know, everyone else to think about and maybe we can turn it into something interesting. The easiest way, the easiest thing in the world is to kill a bad idea by just going, That's a terrible idea. And it might well be a terrible idea. But that's a really demotivating thing to say to someone. And it, does it mean that they'll share the next idea that they've got in their head? That might still be a bad idea, but might have that little thing in it that prompts a spark that turns into a fantastic idea. So never just kill off a bad idea. Always take a moment to think about it and go, is there anything in that idea that's interesting? And, and it might just prompt a thought in your own head that's got nothing to do with that idea, but it goes, oh... I'm, I'm not sure about that one, but that's made me think about this. And it's a springboard to then discuss another route that might be the seed of a fantastic business idea. And even if you've got a strong idea, have a think about having this sort of session anyway. Because what you might do is find that in the discussion, in the kicking things around in a really safe space where everyone feels like they can, you know, kick, you know, kick things about without being, you know, mocked or without, you know, being shut down, you might find that that business idea you've already got gets even stronger. I'm going to finish up by talking about one of the uh, sets of rules that I, I love that are great ways of deciding whether an idea is a good one or a bad one. Um, it also helps you take an idea that's okay and tighten it up and really make it shine and really turn it into something brilliant. Um, and that's to do with Star Wars. Um, so I'm lucky enough that in my spare time I do a bit of work on the side with Lego and I've done some uh, Lego Star Wars stuff. I got to go to a big Star Wars convention, which was fantastic, and I heard a guy speak called Doug Chang. Uh, Doug Chang is one of the production designers for uh, the Star Wars universe, now working for Marvel, obviously. Um, and he has some design rules, and what I found fascinating was that those rules can be applied to having ideas in, in, in business or service spaces where you know, you're coming up with something new that you want people to pay attention to. And so Doug Chang's design rules. So rule one, does whatever you're looking at have a striking silhouette? Is it immediately attention grabbing? So does it make people look twice? And, you know, I think Star Wars does that brilliantly. The spaceships or the vehicles or even the cities or the planets, they are all visually interesting or striking in some way. And that's not just important for spaceships. If nobody notices your product on shelf or nobody 
notices something interesting about the service that you've just described to them, your idea is doomed. Nobody's going to look twice at it. So does your idea spark a glimmer of interest from the people that you've said that you want to be interested in it? If not, make it better. Work out that little thing that you can change in order to make it shine or kill it and have another idea. Then rule two is the three second rule. Is it immediately apparent within three seconds what this thing is and what it does? So does it fly? Does it walk? Which way does it point? In the Star Wars world, is it a vehicle that belongs to the Empire? Is it a vehicle that belongs to the Rebels? And so things like colour schemes work really well in that kind of space. Um, I thought that was fascinating because I think it grounds even the most fantastical ideas and designs in reality. So is it immediately apparent what the potential users of your service or the buyers of your product should do with it? Do they understand what it's for? And if they don't, or if it isn't clear, immediately, I know what that is, I know how that fits into my life. Maybe your idea is a stretch too far and you should start thinking about bringing it back into a more realistic space. And then rule three is exactly about that realism and believability. So one of the reasons I, I, I love Star Wars is it's the believability of that universe. The Star Wars worlds are grubby. They look lived in. The spaceships are patched up and they're dirty. The machinery on display looks like it might actually work and maybe it needs oiled every now and again rather than being these pristine gleaming surfaces and things like that. People have no idea about all the stuff in the background of your idea or your service or your product. And they're not really interested in understanding how it works. But if you're asking them to spend money on it, you have to give them faith that it does work. So actually, is there a way of making sure your idea looks like it will work? Or is there a line that you can put in your marketing that in a really simple, clear way makes people go, all right, yeah, I kind of believe that's going to work. You don't have to explain everything. Just give them a bit of faith that it's going to work. And I think if you follow those three rules out of the Star Wars universe, you end up with brilliant ideas. So take your idea, even if you've got one already, give it a poke, see if it follows Doug Chang's rules from Star Wars, and good luck in the competition. And I'm going to hand over to some of my colleagues now who are going to talk a little bit more about other aspects of marketing. Thank you. Hi. I'm David Roberts, Head of Business at an Edinburgh-based marketing agency called Multiply. At Multiply, we're lucky to work with some of the best brands in the world. Many of the brands you may have heard of, like Highland Spring Water, Listerine Mouthwash, Heinz Beans and Tomato Ketchup. And lots of brands you possibly haven't. Unless, of course, you've been buying mattresses or whiskey, which is unlikely and possibly illegal. If you're interested in what a marketing agency is and what it does, have a look at our website, www.multiplyagency.com. Go and have a look at it and you can find out much more. Over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to introduce you to the world of brand thinking and hopefully help get your enterprise's brand and identity off to the right start. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to look at First principles, such as what is a brand and why is getting your branding important? What makes a brand great? How you can approach thinking about your brand? And how you can check if you've got your branding right? So what is a brand and why is it important? The first thing to realise is almost anything can be a brand. A brand can be a product, a service, a computer programme, a person. Your school is a brand. Countries are brands. You, in your own way, are a brand. Branding, things like logos, are the features that make one brand stand apart from another. So when an artist signs a painting, they are branding it so that people who look at their painting or artwork know which artist it came from. Branding is the mental associations we make with things. Another example, if I ask you to think of a colour you associate with Coca-Cola, we all think about red. If you hear the national anthem of a country, you think of that country. If you see a Nike logo on a t-shirt, you think of sport. All these are associations. 
But brands and their branding is more than a logo. It's everything about how they communicate with their consumers and their audience. So why does it matter? Great branding helps people understand what your enterprise does, what it makes, who it's for, and what it stands for. Look at these examples. Let's take the example of Nike. The name comes from the Greek goddess who personifies victory. The logo incorporates a swoosh, which looks a bit like a tick, but also communicates energy and progress. Without knowing much about Nike or Nike, you can see they've packed a lot of information into their name and their identity. Another great example is Amazon. The name on this occasion doesn't really matter. What's interesting here is they've started off as an online bookseller and now they sell everything. And under their logo, you'll see they have an arrow that goes from the A to the Z and forms the icon of a smile. Similarly, the Beats by Dre logo is designed to look like a very simplistic head wearing a set of headphones from the side. And their name incorporates one of the world's most credible and iconic music producers. In these three, three examples, we've shown what the product does and stands for and how it shines through. For Nike, sporting excellence, so you win. For Amazon, delivering everything from A to Z to make you happy. And for Beats, the most credible sound for today's music. And this matters because consumers who buy them or use them want to be associated with them. They want the brands they buy to rub off on them. And this is particularly important when there's so much choice out there. Imagine you went to a supermarket with a shopping list. If we didn't have brands or brand names, how would we know what to buy and who made it? Next time you go to the supermarket, look how many types of tomato soup there are. If you didn't have brands, you would spend 20 minutes reading labels to find the product you want. Branding and brands make shopping easier. If the shopping list said Heinz tomato soup, you could pick it up in seconds. So what makes these brands great? The best brands are the ones that have the clearest idea of who they are and what they do, and importantly, who they do it for. They've thought about the relationship they want to have their good or service with, with the outside world, and make sure their marketing strategy supports this. All the time, checking that they are four things. One, they're credible. They know who they are and what they do. Two, they're compelling. They understand the consumers and meet their needs. Three, they're distinctive. They understand who their competitors are and make sure that they stand out from them. And finally, they're consistent. They act and behave the same way as a brand time and time again. So how can we apply this thinking to your enterprise and help you create your brand? So, before you think about your brand's name, logo, colours and marketing, you need to think about three things. The easiest way to do this is to get with your team or with some friends and chat about what your brand is and importantly, what it's not. I've put this into three questions. The first question to answer is this. What is our product? Describe your product or service in as simple and truthful language as possible. Imagine you're describing it to someone who has no idea what it is or what it does. Imagine you're talking to a 90-year-old relative who doesn't understand it. Tell them what it is and use as small a word as possible. So, if my product was, say, a bottled water, I would describe it as a natural bottled liquid that quenches my thirst, refreshes me and gives me energy. It's drawn from a well in my garden and 100% natural and is supplied in an eco-friendly cardboard box packaging. I then write this down on a flip chart or piece of paper when I'm most happy with it. The next question to answer in your group is Who's it for? Now, there is a temptation here when answering this question to say everyone. And if you really think about it, what product or service really appeals to everyone? By targeting people you want to engage with, it gives you a focus so you can carry your sales story right 
right to the right places and win your customers. So who's going to buy your product? What age are they? What are they interested in? Why will they buy it? And what will it do for them? So going back to my early example of the bottled water, my water is 100% natural, made in Scotland and has eco packaging. So I'm going to target active adults who are worried about the environment and want to look after the planet. I can also add that these people, as well as being interested in the environment, are also going to be interested in healthy living because they have water with them. The final question can be the hardest and you may need to do a bit of research. So jump onto Google or any search engine or computer and try and find out a bit about your competitors. What are your competitors doing? You need to think about this because if you're going to be saying the same thing as another brand, consumers or people who might buy your product might get confused or simply choose your competitor because it may be cheaper. So, going back to my example of my water brand again, um, I know other brands have eco bottles, uh, but target people from all over the UK. And my product comes in a cardboard container, which is special. I also know that I'm only going to sell it to people from Edinburgh, which makes it really local. And we all know how keen people are to support local businesses. So from my notes and answering the three questions before, the last thing I'm going to do is pull out some of the key words for my brand. The four words I'm going to pick are water, active, environment and Edinburgh. There we have the start of what our brand is, at least in our heads. These are the associations I want to communicate. We call this brand architecture, which is a grand way of saying the document that, in words, tells your business what your brand is and who it's for. We can now think about the creative bit, how we turn this brand, the words, into a brand identity that people will understand and like. So, we know what makes a great brand. We've had to think about our brand or or product now we're going to give that brand or product an identity the first thing you want to think of is a name what you're going to call your product or service the important thing about a name is it should be relevant easy to read and say and ideally be memorable you can get lots of inspiration from the world around you look at these three brands Yorkshire tea it comes from Yorkshire Disney and Dyson are the names of the creators and inventors. And Netflix is used two words, pushed them together. Flix being an old fashioned word for film and net being the short version of internet where you watch them. Going back to my made up water example from earlier, I might call it Robert's Water or EHH2O, which is the Edinburgh postcode and the chemical symbol for water. Going back to this work, you'll remember that two of my words were Edinburgh and water. So I'm going to call it EHH2O. It's okay, but there's a chance that people might pronounce it eh H2O. So I'm going to drop the second H and simply call it EH2O. Now, to make it a logo, and you'll know if a logo is great because it will pass a thing I call a t-shirt test, which is would it look great on a t-shirt? You don't need to be artistic to make a logo or good at Photoshop or even good at drawing to design a logo. Disney and Cadbury's, their logos are simply their creator's signatures. The BBC logo is simply bold clear letters. So have a go at designing it yourself. Draw it on paper or try creating it with a computer. Just have fun with it. Like Apple, you might want the brand Apple, I should say, you might want to include an image or graphic of an apple. Or think about using a colour like Coca Cola and the red. Or shapes like the stars and stripes of a flag that like you see in America. Just make sure 
you have a reason for being there or the icons you use have a reason for being there you don't want them to be anything too random within your group if you each have a goal share your ideas vote on what you like and try and build the ideas together but please remember that this is art you're making it's the ideas that people are sharing so be generous with each other and try not to be too harsh if you don't like someone else's idea ideas can come from the strangest places and you don't have to be good at drawing and you don't have to take my word for it uh, this is the logo i'm going to show now of the iconic i love new york uh, tourist campaign the designer originally wrote it in a taxi on a napkin and once everyone said they liked the idea they designed it and we all know it looks great on a t-shirt interestingly this logo has been existing and selling the city for over 40 years once you've got some ideas for a logo you might have some questions about whether or not it's right uh, or maybe you have a couple of leading ideas and you're not sure which one to go for. So why don't you ask the sort of people you're going to be selling to which one they prefer and ask them why. Brands and businesses use feedback like this all the time to get insight to make their creative ideas work for their audience. Once you've made your decision, stick to it. You will be so tempted to change it in a few weeks, but don't. It's completely natural because it's human nature to get a bit bored of things we create. The important thing to remember is it will be new to the, and exciting to the people who see it for the first time. So trust me, stay with it and stay consistent. You'll thank me later. So to sum up, I hope you find this session useful. We've covered what a brand is, why they are important, and hopefully shared a few tips about how you can start thinking about your brand and striking a right chord with your customers. I've been David Roberts. Good luck, and I look forward to hearing about your brand's future success. Hi everybody, I hope you're having a fantastic day so far. I'm Melissa and I'm here to talk to you about engaging your audience through social media content. Now I head social media, digital marketing and audiences at a creative agency called Wire, which sounds like a very snazzy job title, but what exactly does it mean? Essentially my job is to make companies like Capital Radio, The Baftas, Shout Magazine, Transmit and even Tesco Mobile famous through engaging social media content, PR and advertising. Now when most people think of advertising, they tend to think of TV. But that's just one channel and in my humble opinion there's lots of other more exciting ways that you can bring some of your ideas to life. Ways like putting a giant board game in the centre of Edinburgh. Money, 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 money. From the money tree, fall on me, life's a lottery. Oh, 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 money, can't you see, if you come to me, I'll be so happy. You get me coconuts and banana cake. Live tweeting from the BAFTA red carpet, or in this case, a beige carpet. Putting billboards across Scotland to promote a newspaper. Or even taking the Scottish Cup on tour across the country. Today, I'm here to talk to you about one specific area, however, and that is content and how you can produce something that audiences really want to see. I'm going to give you some of my top advice for creating content that audiences love. And I can't wait to see all your amazing ideas that you come up with. So my first top tip, make sure you understand the marketplace and your audience. I bet you're already brimming with ideas for getting your product seen. But before you start anything, you need to stop and think about who exactly you're speaking to. 
We always create something called a persona for each of our campaigns. We'll imagine who exactly our dream audience are and how our product fits in with their life. For example, when we were working with our client in Edinburgh City Centre who promote the new town in Edinburgh, we were given three key audiences to focus on. Women aged 45 plus who enjoyed shopping and eating in the city centre, young professionals who we knew would be in the city centre for work, and families who were far more likely to visit on weekends. This type of thinking allows us to firstly understand when we can talk to the audience, but it also allows us to understand how we can speak to them too. To give you an example, the young professionals would clearly be more interested in suggestions for what to do after work, while families would be more looking for weekend activities that everybody could enjoy. Once you've outlined the general area of your audience like we have above, you then need to turn them into a real life person. And don't be afraid of this, but it seems a little bit odd, but it works. Um, whenever I go to look at creating a persona, I always ask myself a few core questions and they could be things like, how old is this person? Where do they live? And on that, it's not enough to say a country. Um, think about whether they're in a city centre like Glasgow, in the outskirts like Bishop Briggs, or do they live a lot further out, somewhere like Kilpatrick, for example? This will have a huge, huge impact on how you speak to your audience. Then you need to start thinking about what they do in their spare time. Do they usually go out a lot? And if so, how might the current restrictions make them feel? How can you connect with them on that as well? Do they love listening to music? And if so, could you reach them through a channel like Spotify? What type of music do they listen to? And most importantly, why? Do they like upbeat pop music, for example, something a little bit slower or something really, really unusual? And it's these type of insights that help you understand what type of content you should create for your audience. You can even go as deep as asking things like, well, what is their favorite food? But again, always asking yourself why. Is it something quick and easy that they grab in town, meaning they're probably quite busy? Or is it a special meal cooked by a family member every so often, meaning that they love to bask in those special occasions? Carry on asking yourself questions like this until you feel really, really confident in who you're speaking to. And don't forget to give them a name. It helps you think about them as a real life person. So as an example, if I was selling clothes and I came up with a person called Katie who was 16, I might think, where does Katie shop? Is it primarily online or in person? If she loves sites like Boohoo, maybe I could try and think of some online display advertising there, which is a little bit like this. This is an example we did for our client called Seafish. However, if Katie likes to go out to the shops, I might try and surprise her in the city centre uh, with a big activation like I mentioned before. Don't be afraid of digging too deep into your persona. The more you understand them, the better you'll be able to speak to them. And don't be afraid of thinking of what makes your audience unique. Late last year, we were tasked with naming a new Scottish radio station. And we decided to take a word that Scottish people use more than any other place to connect to that audience, calling it pure radio. It's all about the quirks and all about thinking of your audience as a person and connecting with them on that level. That is the secret to really good communications. Point number two, think about where your audience will be. So it's really, really easy when you're planning content to go straight for the channels that you like to use and the things that you like to see. But as we've just established, your audience won't always be in the same places. Did you know, for example, that while Facebook has the most users of any social media channel in the world, that is 2.7 billion, if you're wondering. Only 50% of 13 to 17 year olds actually use the channel. Instagram, meanwhile, has less than half of the users of Facebook, which is still a cool 1 billion, if you're wondering. Uh, but 72% of 13 to 17 year olds say they use it. If I was trying to speak to Katie, to go back to my previous example, I'm far more likely to reach her on Instagram than Facebook, so that is where I should focus my efforts. Go back to your persona and think about what channels they use, and again, go back to the why. A 48-year-old, for example, probably wouldn't use TikTok, but they will have Facebook. 79% of that age group do. Don't waste effort putting out fantastic content in the wrong channels if your audience aren't going to be able to find it. Point number three, don't speak to your audience too much, but never forget that they're there. So you've got your audience primed, your channels are all set up to go. How do you actually use them? Regular content is critical to success when you're trying to advertise to your audience, but that doesn't mean constantly shouting at them. There are over 95 billion photos uploaded to Instagram each and every day. That is 1,111 every second. It's really, really noisy out there, and to get cut through and get your content seen, you really need to make sure that it means something. 
take your time and think, what do I need to say to my audience? And what's really going to convince them? We usually recommend posting about once or twice a week on most channels, which allows you to take your time to work out what you want to say and why. Sometimes you might have a little bit more to talk about and that's absolutely fine, but make sure you're not overloading your audience and yourself. It's very easy to say a lot when you first start, but think about how you'll continue that pace in the long run. In six months time, how will you keep your messaging exciting and fresh? If you have a lot to say to your audience in a short time, think about how you can use different channels or platforms rather than just one. For example, if I was launching a new product, I might want to announce its launch on the Instagram grid, but then I might support that with some Instagram stories that go into the depth about its features and benefits. Don't think you have to keep putting out content several times a day. You don't. A regular drumbeat is a thousand times better than talking too much or not talking at all. Try opening a calendar and plotting out when you want to say to your, when you want to speak to your audience first. This will help you plan what you're going to say to them and allow you to check you're not giving them the same pace of content too often. Point number four, remember the three second rule. How long do you spend on social media? Personally, I can spend absolutely hours scrolling through content that I just don't really want to see. And it tends to take something really, really special to capture my attention and actually make me stop. This is something I like to call the three second rule. Essentially, you have three seconds maximum to capture someone's attention and make them want to watch your content. If you don't get them in those three seconds, you'll be lost in scrolling history, never to be seen again. Don't waste time on introductions to content that your audience don't care about. Try and excite them as quickly as possible. The easiest way to do this is through really engaging visual assets, and this is where you can have heaps of fun. It could be something really simple, like designing a set of templates that are really ownable by your brand, like we did for the Scots magazine. We designed these using Photoshop, but if you're allowed to use them, there's tons of free programs for your phone or computer to make content look good. Things like Canva, Snapseed, Over, and even PowerPoint. In one of my old roles, I had no access to any program, so I designed everything using PowerPoint. Don't be limited by your resources. There's always a way to make it happen. However, don't be limited just to the simple. Think of how you can do things that people don't expect to see on social media. For example, we made a series of puzzles for a company who wanted to engage businesses with a training programme. The idea being that the audience were interested in solving puzzles, so we thought oh, we'd make our own to make them stop. Or how about a flowchart like we made for our client Seafish, the UK authority on seafood? You could try playing around with GIFs, like this example from Innocent Smoothies. Or you could surprise people with something that grabs their eye like this. This device is called a split death GIF. It's a really simple technique that looks like your post is literally coming from the screen. We use them a lot as they always grab an audience's attention and stand out from other content on a newsfeed. Essentially, creativity is your best friend when it comes to content, which takes me on to my next point. Don't just sell. Do you like being sold to? Because I really, really don't. I hate feeling like someone is trying to force me to buy their product. I want to feel like I've made the decision myself, that I've come across a product and a brand I like, and I therefore have made the decision in my own time. Go back to the audience you made in step one and think, what does this person really want to see from me? What are they currently thinking? And how can I make them feel really, really excited about what I have to offer? Can I solve a problem they currently have? Can I make them feel better? It doesn't just have to be about what you sell. It needs to go back to why your company and product exists. Easier said than done, no? But let me give you an example. Last year, Transmit tasked us with announcing their headliners for the festival. Pretty exciting stuff. And you've probably seen a few posts like this from other festivals that does that job. But we wanted to do something a little bit more exciting. At the time, the world was obsessed with the game HQ, where everyone tuned into a quiz at the same time. So we made our own special version of it, where viewers saw lines of songs by the headliners, with vowels missing, and they had to guess who the act was from that. There's a little example here.
So why do we do this? Quite simply, because it works. We got 764% more likes, comments and shares from one post than three of Glastonbury's headliner announcements got combined. Which takes me on to my very last point. Think about what success looks like. Ultimately, what do you want your audience to do when they see your content? Set yourself goals and make sure you track against them. Don't just focus on sales conversions. They're obviously really, really important, but nobody is going to buy if they don't know who you are and what you're offering. Think about how many people you need to reach and how many people will need to visit your website, for example. And then on top of that, think of how many of those people will actually convert. Did you know that the average website conversion rate is just 2.35%? That means that of all the people that come to your website, only 2.35% will go on to buy your product. I mean, to put that into context, if I set myself the goal of 300 sales of my product, I'd need to get 12,766 people to my website to go on to purchase and achieve that goal. Think beyond the immediate goal that you've got at hand and think about how you'll get there. The stronger your goals, the better you'll be able to see if content is actually working. And that's it. Keep your audience front of mind, make sure you're regularly chatting to them, know what success looks like, and then most importantly, be creative and have fun. Nobody wants to see the same piece of content over and over again, so think outside the box with whatever you do. Good luck, I can't wait to see all you'll achieve, and I'm so excited to see your campaigns come to life and hear more about your ideas.